thank you, Jeff, and Brian, and to all the speakers who have uh, created a really interesting backdrop to speak into. Um, and my name is Chris Jaggers. I'm with a software company called Learning Machine. And so I'd also like to th thank the ministry who's graciously invited uh, me here to speak on the topic of the blockchain and how it can be used to secure student records. Um, and I was particularly moved by Everest's opening talk that um, really, conf where he links these seemingly disparate worlds of education, employment, um, and, and to his latter point, rights, um, and, and, and empowering people um, to be able to enforce their rights is actually a very interesting backdrop to this topic. Um, and it's a difficult topic to speak to because, um, one, not only does it cut against the grain, uh, against a lot of traditional intuition about how things work, but there's also a lot of misinformation uh, about the blockchain. So before I go into trying to describe the technical details of how it works, like explaining the magic trick of how a digital record could actually be tamper-proof uh, and independently verifiable, um, I want to speak into uh, maybe some of the problems that it's solving, that it's not just a new technology, that today, um, as we transmit student records, they're still essentially paper-based. Even if they're um, presented as a PDF, um, we're still living in a paper-based economy of student records, um, which has a lot of problems. There's widespread fraud, uh, more so than I think people realize. Uh, I just heard a statistic in the U.S. alone. There's hundreds of thousands of confirmed uh, diplomas that are printed that are fraudulent, that are known of, which means there's probably many, many more that are not known of, and that's just in the U.S. Um, as Philip Schmidt was saying yesterday, there's a lack of data behind how they're being used, uh, when they're being used, uh, a difficulty of reporting um, national metrics, um, and they're difficult to use for everyone involved. They're difficult for students who are going from high school to college to apply. If you've ever worked in admissions, it's very hard to match official records to uh, individuals. Uh, for lifelong learners that may be going back to college uh, 10, 20, 30 years later that are suddenly asked to produce their diploma or transcript, uh, they can't, it's gone. Um, but that's their data, right, which goes to the last point of you know, student records belong to the students. Um, so how can, how can they be presented to them in a better format that, that where they can actually build a lifelong learning record that they control and they can use in multiple environments? Not just it within school, but it, it applying for employment uh, or crossing borders um, in, in many contexts. Um, and before I, I speak to the solution, I, I think we need to consider solutions in the light of ongoing trends which have been uh, well talked about already by all our great speakers. Um, the, the two I want to highlight, as, as Dr. Haywood has talked about a lot, is uh, the trend of globalization. The, you know, in the past, we talked about globalization as lowering the cost of goods, you know, so ships and railways have rejuvenated the world. Um, uh, with, with the lowering cost of transport. Today we talk about globalization with, in the light of uh, information and communication technologies, as Dr. Haywood has pointed out, uh, and, and, and Brian as well. Um, but I'd say there's a third kind of globalization that's happening, um, which is not just how that information has become cheaper to move, but the mobility of people has become enabled. It is, telepresence, VR, and a variety of uh, 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 new service level jobs that allow people to work anywhere they want. There is, uh, it's suddenly becoming easier and easier for people to live and work wherever they want. Um, and, and that's the positive side of globalization. Of course, there's a lot of migration on the negative side of displaced peoples. Um, so th when you think about globalization, don't just think about it in terms of the lowering cost of information, but people are on the move all around the world, and that's going to have dramatic consequences. We also have the unbundling of education um, uh, with, with both positive and negative forces. Um, the positive forces have been talked a lot about today, uh, new models of education, um, making it more atomized, um, but, but the negative pressure causing unbundling education is a really confluence of, of dangerous things, of uh, low graduation rates. Uh, we heard 
Um, uh, the director of education and culture say here in Europe that one in 10 students who start don't get a diploma. That's actually pretty good. Uh, in the US, 50% of students who start uh, higher education don't finish, 50%. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, a lot of them uh, have economic pressures. They, they're coming in with college credit. Um, they don't have the money to finish school. They just want to acquire a particular skill to get a job. But nevertheless, with the cost of tuition rising and people not finishing school, they're leaving with a mountain of debt without anything to show for it, without the ability to get a job, and it's hurting the finances of schools as well. Um, this is combined with employ employer dissatisfaction, <laughs> which is creating a storm of pressure to, to um, lower the stakes of the four-year degree in terms of professional certifications, skills certifications, uh, competency-based education, basically unbundling the education so um, more attain attainable units of achievement um, can, be, can be issued and utilized in the world. Um, so I, I just wanted to, at the risk of repeating the other speakers, uh, just provide that as a backdrop um, into why uh, this new technology of the blockchain is important. And just to make it really concrete at the start, the, the benefits of this technology is that it allows schools to issue students official records, like a diploma, a transcript, or anything. Um, here we have an example of uh, a digital certificate showing someone graduated from the Media Lab. Uh, and these digital records are tamper-proof, they can't, they can't be spoofed, and they can be independently verified by anyone without having to consult the original institution. So this is, this is kind of counterintuitive because the internet has created a, an abundance of information and digital copies and it's easy to access information, but it's also created a scarcity of authenticity, of trust. And so here we have a technology that, that counterintuitively um, provides essentially unhackable uh, technology and allows people to own their own digital records and use them directly in the world when applying for a job, when applying for subsequent education, without having to request it from the original school and go through the arduous process of sending it around. So I guess the, that begs the question, how does this work? Uh, so I'm going to try to explain that in a couple minutes uh, without getting too much as a, of a computer science uh, talk. Um, it starts, uh, the underlying technology is the blockchain. And so what is the blockchain? Um, and the Bitcoin blockchain is an immutable ledger uh, that's public that stores transactions uh, across a global decentralized network. The Bitcoin blockchain has been uh, in the world for the last 10 years and growing rapidly. Uh, it, it is a public infrastructure and a security invention that's unparalleled that I believe will be as fundamental uh, as the internet. And so there's a couple of things that are counterintuitive right away that you have uh, a quality infrastructure uh, and a secure infrastructure that's decentralized. No one company owns this, no one country uh, owns it or can control it. It's very much like the internet. It's a new public infrastructure. Um, and a lot of people, I said, I guess I saw yesterday a third of you had heard of the, the blockchain. Um, so I'll try to keep that in mind. Um, but for 10 years, it's been recording financial transactions of when one person sends money to another person. But it's actually capable of storing any kind of uh, transaction. Um, so in the case of financial transactions, it only records a small bit of data. It's not storing documents. It's not storing a lot of information. But in the case of a financial transaction, it says who sent it, who received it, how much, and perhaps some other information. So that seems perfect for a financial transaction, but how does that relate to an academic transaction, to conferring a degree? Well, it's basically the same information. Who sent it? Who received it? The amount is dust, it's, it's immaterial. And some other content, um, which is important for proving uh, the validity uh, of the certificate later. And this information is not really floating public in the public domain. All of it is, is pseudonymous uh, and encrypted through one-way hashes. Um, so there's only the tiniest bit of information um, recording that a transaction took place 
that can be used to verify uh, the transaction later. Um, so we're not talking about putting student records on some public database. You know, I, 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 that's usually the first kind of reaction I hear. Um, so let's, let's make it look more concrete. So normally an academic credential is given in the form of some sort of certificate. And we're using the certificate generically here. It could be a diploma, it could be um, a transcript, it, it could be a, a course completion, membership. It could even potentially be a voucher for something. Um, but digi a blockchain certificate are basically digital records that are cryptographically signed by the issuing school. They're tamper-proof and they're independently verifiable by using the blockchain as a notary. So here in this example, it, we're, we're using our MIT graduation uh, diploma. Um, and that's, that's just the presentation layer. Just like a website has a presentation layer that's driven by code underneath it, like HTML, this has code underneath the presentation layer. Um, in this case, we're using JSON. And it's that content layer that actually contains uh, all of the information, the immutable record, uh, uh, the information that's being displayed on the certificate, which can include images and text uh, and metadata. And then the last layer of a certificate is the receipt that uh, stores proof of the transaction. So it doesn't actually st uh, store the whole uh, content, but it's actually a, a one-way hash uh, of the content. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the one-way hash, it's basically you can take any uh, document or image and reduce it into a set of alphanumeric numeric numbers um, that are mathematically connected to it. So you can't, you can't reverse this hash. You can't use a hash and generate content. Um, but you can check a hash to make sure that no content has been changed later. So it's really only this hash of the certificate that's stored on the receipt. And that receipt, which you saw at the back, can I go backwards? No. Um, at the back of the certificate is stored on the learner held record, which is ultimately on a mobile device. And that receipt is also stored on the blockchain. So when verification happens, it's checking, does the receipt on the, on the learner certificate match the receipt that's stored on the blockchain? If anything's been changed, the receipts won't match and it won't verify. So it's tamper evident. Rather than trying to control this as a company, we, we recognized early on that this is a fundamentally new technology that needs to be open, that uh, schools need to be able to easily adopt for free, that other vendors need, need to be able to build uh, with this tool set um, easily uh, and, and, and to not necessarily compete with each other, but to cooperate in building new normals around what digital records are considered to be. So throughout uh, 2016, we collaborated with MIT to build an open standard for um, creating, uh, issuing, uh, holding, and verifying blockchain-based certificates. This can be found at blockcerts.org. Um, its audience is primarily a technical audience, but it is a full toolkit that's free and open in every sense of the word um, that Cable pointed out yesterday. Um, people can use it immediately to issue records. Um, they can copy it, they can modify it and build their own, or they can become part of the community uh, and help build out new features. So this is important because standards, as you know with new technologies, uh, help secure um, the longevity of a new technology. When different vendors and institutions and networks uh, orbit around a standard, uh, it allows these, um, allows data to interoperate more easily. Um, and it also helps uh, prove, uh, ensure the longevity of new technology. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, we think uh, this is very important. And again, it's not just for schools, it's also been made for vendors who want to make commercial products uh, using the standard and extend them in scalable ways with additional features that provide additional convenience. Um, so hopefully this is a resource for everyone. Um, and just to uh, review a little bit about the ecosystem which I've been talking about, I want to take kind of a bird's eye view of how this logistically works. How, how do students get their, these certificates? Um, and you know, the mobile device 
and the ubiquity of mobile is really what's made this possible because these mobile devices can handle all the crypto key management stuff in the background without any technical awareness from the average person. You know, the average kid can download a mobile app and add a friend uh, easily. It's one of the first things you do with an app. Um, with this app, one of the first things they do is add their school. That sends a public key to the school, um, which uh, then is, th the school has their name, their email, and their public key, which establishes a strong connection so the school knows exactly who they're issuing the certificates to. Schools then have a way to create certificates uh, and schedule their issuance to cohorts in batches um, so that two things happen. One, the, the certificates get logged on the blockchain. They, the, they basically get notarized with those little bits of transaction data. And the digital record goes, it appears in the student's mobile app. Um, from there, they can hold it privately. They can um, share it online or privately with a third party if they want. Basically, it's a digital record that can't be taken from them. Uh, even if their issuer, uh, the original school, disappears, uh, or, or if their government disappears, in fact. Um, and then where it comes uh, into play with employment is when they want to share this certificate, perhaps, uh, with an employer, they can apply through any normal applicant tracking system, and the act of sharing their certificate may be a link, it may be attachment, that's often up to the employer, but it's easy to share. And then that, that employer, rather than having to request the certificate from the original school, can simply, um, they, they can have verification services built into the applicant tracking systems already used, so they just automatically know whether certificates are valid or not. Um, or if they're using an applicant tracking system that doesn't have that service built in, um, they could always go to uh, uh, perhaps a school-hosted or country-hosted depository where they could paste a link and get an immediate verification. Um, so as a whole, it's, it's, it's a far more efficient process um, with fewer dependencies and, and no need to really trust uh, people directly because it's been replaced with uh, trusting a technology that can't be spoofed. When you move this to the national view, I mean, try to imagine a world where every kind of school, not just higher, uh, higher education, but even professional education, uh, medical uh, prof um, professional certifications, uh, where everything across a nation is employing um, this fundamentally digital uh, way of issuing and tracking what has happened in the country. And when you do that, you start to get a national picture of trends um, to help drive policy decisions, to help, in fact, know what's going on uh, in real time without the arduous work of building reports. Um, and and that's, a kind, that's a layer of analytics and, and, a, con and, a, and a connection to students that hasn't existed before. Um, and so I think it provides uh, amazing opportunities um, to learn about what's happening, particularly as education is changing, right? We need an infrastructure that is flexible and light enough to deal with constant change, but secure enough um, that, that whatever is recorded isn't going to, and to fall apart. Uh, and the blockchain is really the only solution I see um, that, that mixes both of those qualities. So I know we're coming to the end of time. So my last slide is just to highlight some of the overall benefits of it, that these digital records are user or learner controlled. They own them. Um, they can be independently verified. Um, so when you get this document, um, there's ways to, to verify it in a way that you couldn't trust a PDF. Um, they're data driven. So the issuers of these certificates get new, new layers of data they've never gotten before. And all of this is supported by an open community. The Bitcoin blockchain is an open source, open community. Uh, block certs, which is a way of talking to the blockchain, is an open source, open community. Um, and so the, the foundations um, are lively um, and, uh, and, and still changing. It's still early days. But this is a technology that's here today. This is not a future uh, trend. And we're beginning to work with uh, schools to roll this out. Um, so it's an exciting time, and I think it's something you're going to see happen slowly at first and then all at once. 
Um, so hopefully I haven't gone totally over on time and we can uh, open it up for questions. Well, first, uh, applause for this really nice presentation.